Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining our weekly podcast. I'm Robin Lewis, founder and CEO of The Robin Report, which, by the way, is really much more than a daily report. It's, it's really a knowledge platform uh, from which uh, we communicate thought leadership on various strategic topics, yes, uh, through the, the reports, but also these podcasts. And we also do webinars and probably some live events in the future. And along with our chief strategist, Shelley Cohan, and who, by the way, is also a professor at FIT and Syracuse University, we welcome you to our conversation on the topic of operating globally in today's disruptive marketplace. Boy, that can't be any clearer, right? <laughs> anyway, um, and today we're honored, by the way, to have Marcella Wartenberg, who is the Chief Executive Officer of AWWG. And uh, for those who may not be fam uh, familiar with AWWG, they are uh, the global fashion group, which integrates the brands, Pepe Jeans, uh, London, Hackett and Fasinable, and is the licensed distributor for Tommy Hilfiger and Calvin Klein in Spain and Portugal. Um, she assumed the CEO role in 2019, and Marcella's vision is a strategy focused on consumer and product. She has enhanced uh, AWWG sales, the performance of the group's brands, and its growth in key global markets. Uh, previous, previ previously, <laughs> Marcella work, uh, worked for PVH Corp, uh, where she held various senior management positions, such as Chief Merchandising and Global Licensing Officer for Calvin Klein, um, President of PVH Europe, and country manager of PVH Mexico. Wow, Marcel, it's a big time career path. Incredible <laughs> resume there. So um, by the way, AWWG has over 4,000 employees around the world and have they have over 500 brand stores with 5,000 points of sale. Another wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, Marcella, yeah, I mean, you're terrific, and we really are very excited that you're joining us, and and are really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. So, first of all, thank you very much, Robin Shelley, for having me today in your podcast. It means a lot for me. It's it's very important for today's work to connect, to connect with people, with leaders, with people in the industry, and partners that help this industry grow. I think the retail business and the fashion industry is changing rapidly. So it's great to have this platform and that I can be part of a contributor, future leader, another leader, and also connect. So thank you very much. We're so you're excited welcome. to have you here. And Marcella, you're actually, you have a big speaking gig coming up because you are going to be speaking at the World Retail Congress, uh, which is taking place in Barcelona, April 25th through the 27th. And uh, Robin and I recently had Ian McGregor, the chairman and CEO of World Retail Congress here. Um, and he was talking about the big event. And he also talked to us a little bit about the theme of this year's event, which is retail leadership for extraordinary times. Um, and as Robin alluded to earlier, probably a bit of an understatement in terms of what the industry has gone through. I really feel like the industry has grown 10 years in the last three years. Uh, so but sure. we would love for you to share what it's been like for you as a leader in these last few years, and maybe what lessons you've learned or what you're taking from your experience over the past few years and how you're using that forward. Oh, well, it's very interesting. I think you said it very rightfully. It's three years have become what we maybe did on the last 20 years. I think uh, the industry used to have, it was always a fast industry because fashion has always been a fast industry. However, I think today is not even fast enough. It's it's a speed that goes beyond the light. 
it is, um, I think we're, we're dealing with different things. We deal with speed, but also with a lot of consumer behaviors. So this has been a totally disruptive world because we deal with four generations with totally different behaviors. We sometimes forget about it, but uh, they, 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 the retail industry has baby boomers that has certain experience, expect certain service, is expecting also certain tools. And then you have a Gen Z that is totally born with a digital mindset. And when you have brands or a retail environment where you need to cater two or three generations in one location, you always have a mix of the four generations, but you have more a target for one specific, and then you, you can go more, a little bit more to the left or to the right. It becomes a very big challenge for the companies to say, okay, how do I cater that consumer? How do we make sure that we get for the baby boomer, the experience and service we have, and to the Gen Z, the digital needs? So the investments for the companies has been a lot on how do we make sure that we don't lose this and we invest in this? So it's almost like double because you need to continue renovating yourself and at the same time adding new. And it's very disruptive also because it's also not only at consumer level. I also think that employees were dealing with four type of leadership. What is the expectation of an employee? How do they like to work remote and hybrid versus being at the office five days a week? What is the priorities for one than the other one? one I think Gen Z is very focused on living the moment, the experience. That's what they, they want to enjoy life. Uh, baby boomers, we grew up thinking, okay, we need to build for the future. We need to build <clears throat> the day that we are going to be pensioned. I think it, we were thinking too much on the future and, and new generations thinks about it today. So the disruptor comes everywhere. Now, yeah. is this a good or a bad thing? I think disruption is very good. I think disruption keeps you awake. It can also make you evolve. But the nicest thing is that it has shown us something, that we need to be agile. Today, industry that is not agile would not be able to survive. It's not about only innovation. It's how fast you can react to the good things, yeah. but also yeah. to the certain mistakes. It's, <clears throat> You need to test and try and disconnect and connect. And there's nothing wrong with it because it's just evolving. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you really hit on all the key points, Marcella. Uh, uh, really terrific. And two of them stick out. One is this word fast and speed. And the other is agility. And um, I think technology and the consumer today is driving um these companies and and your companies and all all of the retail industry to to move faster and uh some of the real big giant retailers you know they, they they've built cultures back in the last century and they have to change those cultures and a lot of them are struggling and the, one of the major issues for them is are they doing it fast enough um, and I, I, I really think a lot of them are not, and that's going to be, and, and to be able to, to do it more quickly and make the transformation, um, speedier, uh, they've got to be very agile as you point out. Okay. So, um, you know, you really started out here by saying, <laughs> <laughs> giving us the whole picture, which is, yeah, which is great. And, you know, that's why you're doing so well. Yeah. I, I think so, that we need to think that. Agility, you need to convince the people that that's the way to go. Yeah. But to convince them, they need to believe on your plan. So there yeah. are things very important today that communication is becoming a key thing. So to change, you need the people. You can have a vision, you can have a dream. But yeah. to make that happen, you need to start with the people. Yeah. You can think about the product. You can think about the store. You can think about the e-commerce website. You can think about the consumer, everything. But if we don't have the people to execute that, that That's recipe right. is not going to work. So I, yeah. when we started the transformation in the organization, the first thing I say is I need to start by communicating that transformation to everyone. Mm -hmm. And it's a cultural transformation. Yep. Once everybody could get that mindset, then I said, now we can start driving. But it was very important to invest, to share that. I always say the North Star, that vision to the organization. And, these are yeah. going to be the priorities. So long-term vision, 
short-term remedies, you know, priority, let's move. Yeah, yep. Um, so, so what are the main objectives of, of that transformation strategy? And what is it that you're kind of hoping to achieve? Okay, I think that the, the main transformation are two. One is to create brand equity. Today, there's two types of companies. The ones are the commodities or the one that you want to build brand equity. Both yeah. are needed in the business. I always say, you need commodity product like a supermarket, but you also want some special gourmet things. If everyone opens their kitchen, you want both. Same thing if you go to restaurants, you want to go sometimes to a fast a restaurant, but you also want sometimes a beautiful dinner where you can have a conversation. <clears throat> so in our case, any brand that we take in the portfolio and the brands we have today in the portfolio is to real build brand equity. And it's oh. brand, building brand yeah. equity by transformation because brands need to evolve and they need to transform. It's a brand that stays static, you are going to lose. And we know a, little, a, a few examples in our lives of things that were so iconic in a certain moment that they just disappeared by not evolving. I always put an example. Um, I love BlackBerry when it was BlackBerry moment, but they didn't evolve. And there's always someone trying to evolve technology. And what happened? I was one of the last ones to get out of my BlackBerry and I was having both. <laughs> and today we learn how to, to evolve. So I think brands need to transform and evolve. That doesn't mean revolution. It's evolution. I always say, take it away, they are. So that's the North Star. It's let's always look at the brand. What's the brand for? How do we make sure we continue being relevant for the target consumer we have? You can be everything, but if you have a brand, be something. And the other important thing is industry is here to make money in a way that all industry needs to have, either you're in the stock market or you're owned by a private fund, at the end, you need to be profitable. To survive, you need to be profitable. So our goal is create brand equity by transformation with the ambition to always be double digit profitability. Then you know for everyone it's nice to dream, but also let's make it a business. Yep. I think when that was the North Star, that's always the vision. However, the priority is coming back to your question, Robin, is it starts by products and consumers. So we have five pillars that are our mantra. And the priority is under each of these pillars. So the projects, they evolve every year. So the, the five, uh, I would say, strategic priorities are always random products. Second one, it's all about consumer engagement. It's not marketing, it's consumer engagement. How do we speak to them? The third one is distribution enhancement. And I know there's many questions about channels and distribution. So, but all channels are valid and we can talk more about it later. The fourth is the integration of the digital world in our business, digitalization. That brings you smartification, optimization. And last but not least, it's people. So it starts by brands and it ends with people that's ours. So in all these, every year, all the departments, all the organization needs to think how we are gonna make sure that these five strategic pillars are having the proper projects. Marcella, that's a, I love how you outlined that. And I have to say, you and I are the last two BlackBerry people uh, that were there. <laughs> and I love that analogy. It was great until it wasn't. Right. <laughs> it just right. fell off the earth, right? Super. Um, but I think when we look at, so you outline these five great pillars, which are amazing, but then when you take what you just outlined and you think about what you said earlier, that, and then you have five generations of customers and five generations of employees and trying to, you know, get that strategy going uh, is really actually quite complex, easier said than done for sure. Um, but, you know, yeah. we would love to hear more about the business environment in Spain and Portugal. Yeah. Now, Rob and I spent a lot of time in the U.S. market, and there's certainly a lot to talk about in the U.S. market. Um, but what's happening down in the Iberian Peninsula? And the other thing I'd love to get some input on is any thoughts you have about the Brexit, like has it impacted your business or, you know, might be a podcast, its own podcast down the road, but love to just kind of get some preliminary thoughts uh, from you on that as well. So I need to say that the, the environment in the Iberian, Spain and Portugal is very positive. I mean, we distribute to 60 countries. So it's very easy to see the thermometer 
between the different countries. I think the Mediterranean countries trend by nature to be more positive. They're always, I always say, they're the last ones to hit, but also I think they, they have a, a way to say, okay, life is it's great. So the rich environment is good. Also, the big advantage is that because of the weather, people go out a lot. Oh, yeah. And when you have good yeah. weather, you spend more money because you go out, you see friends. So I need to say, you see here a very stable shopping behavior, challenging in the way that costs are affecting us. We need to be careful with that. There's an inflation there that we need to acknowledge. We cannot hide that there has been an inflation. We know that there's a slowdown on the economy. So it's going to be a very big thing about market share. Mm. So the investment in marketing, the investment on product, the investment on service and experience are key in order for you not to lose market share. So in general, we see positive numbers. Even in, one, in two of our brands, we see extremely good uh, growth because I think we have invested a lot on, 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 this, on the five priorities. I think where everybody is suffering a little bit is the inflation, the salary raise, it's affecting everyone. You know, you have big stores, big, big employees, big companies. So that is, of course, always a challenge. People get nervous. Yep. Different to other countries. We see that it's much more cautious, for example, in Germany. We see that our stores and our customers in Germany are much more cautious about the situation. They are heated more because the war is closer to them. Yeah. So, uh, and the, and still there's not good weather. So that also yeah, doesn't, help, yeah. doesn't help for people to go out. Um, we still see very low temperatures. So spring product is not selling out so fast. But I will say that the environment in, in Germany, it's, it's, they're much more cautious now. Coming to the third region that I always call the, the the UK, no big market for us, mainly for Hackett, it's one of the big markets. Uh, Brexit, I think has affected more on the supply chain process and the logistics process. But if you think about the brand, it has not really changed because the consumer still acquires the product the same way. They want to have the same pro European <laughs> product or global product. They don't want, so it's more about how do we coordinate the logistics, for example, the e-commerce. So one of the big things that uh, we implemented was to have most of our e-commerce sales to be shipped from our stores in the UK, because this makes a huge difference. You don't need to go through customs for each package. Delivery time is much faster. Costs are much uh, costs are much lower. So, for example, we implement for the for the UK a lot of shipping from store uh, from store and creating a mini hub of just e-commerce shipments, also for the returns. So it's more on that side that has affected more than really on, on the product and the brand. And the people, I think for, for the consumer, if we think about consumers, borders today are not existing. Uh, I, you know, government regulations or agreements are not existing. Yes, you need to go through a passport control, but for the consumer, it's still part of Europe. Right, but true. Yeah, yeah. And and digital has really helped to close to break all the borders. You know, you can be in Canada buying an American brand. You know, you can be in Chile only so by acquiring something from Miami. I think everything has has changed around. So that's also helping a lot. That Brexit is not affecting from a consumer point of view, just from a from a process operations point of view. You know, um, Marcel, you you hit on a point that. Um, I coined a, a phrase uh, about 20 years ago, <laughs> and that is share wars. I kind of took off of Star Wars. But in this country, at least in the United States, we've been overstored for probably a half a century. And um, so the battle is always about stealing share from somebody else. The, the organic growth is it, it's it's slow. And as but but the pie keeps getting bigger because we keep getting more um you know people launching business and now you take uh the online business and just adds to all that so yeah everybody's competing for share which takes uh, a lot of energy 
So uh, on another uh, topic here, in the United States and certainly other parts of the world, I'm sure uh, it's affecting you, um, the devastating supply chain issues over the past few years that have really prompted um, many retailers to totally reevaluate the amount and variety of merchandise assortments in the business. Um, we, we call it SKU optimization. Mm -hmm. And many retailers are also looking at near real-time allocation. Um, so can you, you know, tell us if you are experiencing similar challenges? And if, I think uh, so, yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I think there's two things here. One is we need to be much more rational how we organize our collections for different reasons. One is working capital. We need mm. to think that we cannot have products sitting there for four to five months oh, yeah. because it's just healing the working capital of an organization. Yeah. Second, the customer gets bored to see the same product for five months. You know, you put it in September. Oh, we will put it on the sales after Christmas. It just, you, you go to the store and you see the same. So I think here there's a few things that more than a schedule optimization, I, I will always say is flow optimization. What's the flow of the product? Mm. Because reducing too much the collection can also hurt the brands. Uh, that's my point of view. Uh, why is this? Because you don't want to become a commodity. You are still selling a lifestyle. You're selling special product. I think in the in the industry, there's very commodity brands that are very important. But also, once you have a brand DNA, a heritage, a legacy you want to build, you need to build that novelty for people to buy it again. Because you know, otherwise, you will buy every three years. So you need to have a reason to buy. So the reason to buy is have new product. However, the depth of the product is very important. Do you need for fashion items the same depth than you need it for a basic? So in the past, we said we need to produce a lot, a lot of volume. And otherwise, you know, a lot of stuff and a lot of volume. Sometimes it's very good that something is sold out. So the consumer next year will buy it earlier because they say, I don't want to, I don't want to miss this item. We have also spoiled the consumers by having everything everywhere all the time. Yeah. So what happens then? Oh, I wait in two months. It's gonna be with thirty percent off. In forty percent, it's gonna. I think we need to change that mindset. Everyone to say it's not about having product for markdown. We need to create appetite, desire for the consumers to buy it at full price. Then everybody will make more profit, but also we will be able to have more run on stock turns less markdowns, better working capital, less waste, because that I always tell the people, the more leftovers, it's becoming a bigger problem on sustainability waste. We don't, everybody wants to be sustainable, but in the moment that you tell them there's way, oh no. So SKU optimization for me is range optimization from a flow to the number of styles. I agree, doing too much is bad, but doing too little is also dangerous for a brand to become too flat. So um, it's an interesting topic. I think it's one of the biggest yeah. topics that all companies we are confronting. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah it's a real problem. I like your uh, everywhere, all the time, all at once, or, you know, it's, it's true. Yeah. And I love your uh, flow optimization. Uh, we, do, we do talk about SKU optimization so much here. And it's, it's really, you're right. It's really about the flow of goods. Um, and Robin and I actually recently had a, a podcast called Re Retooling and Speeding Up the Retail Model. And so that really what prompted us to have that one is this yeah. inventory overload that's just seriously clogging up our retail systems and really, you know, as you said, tying up the capital and straining profits from a lot of the retailers. So we believe there's this new paradigm shift of retailers trying to react in near real time to this constantly changing customer demands. And it's becoming a game of what we like to say, beat the clock, um, when product is being matched to uh, purchasing in real time. We also discussed in our podcast, this whole direct to consumer model and how a lot of direct to consumer models are now opening up to marketplaces and how we have a lot of physical stores that are now yeah. doing pop-up shops and other retail environments. Um, all to really just further advance customer reach and drive loyalty. 
I'm wondering if you're seeing the same thing or you have any plans in your future of embarking on any of these uh, new models. I think it's very important to have new models. I think we need to make sure that we are getting closer to the consumer. Many people that e-commerce is gonna change, but for e-commerce to succeed, you need to create brand awareness. And to create brand awareness, you need some stores, pop-up stores, some events, activations. I think otherwise they do need to spend a lot of money to create brand awareness just digital. So it's very important to have that. That's one part. The other reason why I believe really on the physical stores and the pop-up stores is in the physical is you still have the brand experience and you can create multiple ticket, uh, uh, multiple items ticket because it's showing the brand DNA from a whole way which pan goes with which jacket to get new ideas of styling that sometimes in e-commerce, you go straight. I want the pan to click the pan to put it in the basket and ready. So I believe very much in physical stores. I just think the balance between physical stores needs to be sometimes mapped out based on consumer. I, you know, it's again, you don't need to have a shop every corner. Sometimes it's good for the consumer to drive at least 10 minutes to get to the store. Pop-ups, it's incredible because it's an unexpected. People like to be surprised. So suddenly you're walking and I say, oh, what happened here? So I like pop-ups because of that. I, it's not that you will sell a lot, but you will have that wow moment to say, oh, that something happened here. Maybe you have a small assortment, but that will create brand awareness. Yeah. It will make people go into your e-commerce and click. You can create a... Also something fun on the pop-up. It can be an experience, can be customization. It can be about designing your own item. I think it's also a way to connect with the consumer and see also how the consumer is moving, speak to the consumer. E-commerce is more mainly a one way and virtual. Sometimes you need that emotional. I always say to everyone in all my conferences, I'm sure you will hear it in Barcelona, is the fashion industry is an emotional business. We sell emotions. We exist mm -hmm. on your first day of school. We are there <sighs> for your wedding. We are there when you in, met someone that you like. Uh, when you became a, a mother or a fan, you remember, I was going, what am I going to wear? So we are still <laughs> connected to emotions. Yeah. So disappearing <clears throat> physical stores and disappearing pop-up stores, it can also miss the emotion. You are going to miss it. Now, the whole thing is the balance because physical stores have certain costs. Pop-ups have certain cost and e-commerce. The most important is that the, you think about it from a brand perspective, profitability, and not only by a channel profitability. Yeah, you hit on one of my greatest uh, <laughs> topics. Uh, you know, I've written about the fact that this is the distribution century. And the point you made is couldn't be more true and we're going to see more of it and it's going to accelerate and that is getting closer to the consumer and being on many different um, distribution platforms uh, you know from pop-ups to small stores to websites to you know and that's another reason for that is uh, uh, this business of share wars when you've got to you know you've got to be there first faster and more often than your competitors and um so it sounds to me like you really, you you, you got it. <laughs> so we're trying. I think everyone in the industry is, is trying to get it. We test everything, but you're right, uh, Robin. I think uh, it is. A, yeah. It's a work where we need to to think multi options. Yeah. And um, well, the other the other element that Shelley and I've been keeping a watch on is the shift in consumer spending. And of course, in the U.S. market, but um, the consumer price index in the U.S. has gone up, up and away. And many consumers are feeling the pinch, especially on non-discretionary spending. So do you have any insights on the consumer market and shifts in shopping behavior where, where you are, you know, positioned? Uh, no, yeah. yes. Look, prices has gone up in Europe between in the fashion industry between eight and I would say almost reaching 20%, depending on the brands. Wow. Okay? Yeah. I think that 
there's a few things because you take you always take average price. It's very difficult to compare apples to apples. I think one of the important things is um, that's one. Second, the shifting of of expenditure has changed a lot. Number one, it's really we have on the top three. It's all about health, education, and definitely experience. Travel has become massive mm. on, on the on the on the wallet of someone. Mm. So what happens with the retail and fashion industry is becoming already fourth, fifth, but there's a moment you need to satisfy that. So what I again is we need to gain market share. So you need to be spending and investing on brand awareness, speaking to the consumer. However, I said, okay, we need to increase prices. Cost of living is increasing. Yeah. Uh, my salaries are increasing. My raw materials are increasing. My supply chain is increasing. I cannot sell the pearl for the same price. However, how do you create, and I will go again to the range optimization is, if there used to have, I will always say, something that was costing you price opener was, let's put it this way, 50 euros, just to put a number. You should still offer something for 50 euros to the consumer. Oh, right. But maybe mm. you need to offer, instead of 10 items at 50, maybe you offer just two so that they still know that there is something for that. Now, mm. Instead of only increasing the price for nature, companies, we have the obligation to find new ways on how to make it better. It's about price value. So maybe you can increase 15% the price, but to give a better quality or engineer the product to a way. And that's where I always say engineering designers or engineering product developers are key. How do you make sure that the same item may instead of I always say, instead of putting four uh, zippers in a jacket, maybe the, you don't need the zippers in the in the pockets and put a button. That already helps to bring back your margins. So I think we need to have engineering things that are not affecting the design or the fit. I think the companies are also looking at, at we are doing a lot on that on what we call optimization of or of our process, because sometimes you also need to find new ways, and it's not about people. It's, how, what can you do in the organization to have less costs so that you can invest better in the product? Yeah. So it's our <clears throat> obligation to make sure that it's not only increase the price, everything eight to 20% is, what do you increase 15? Okay, I'm gonna increase it 15 because I'm gonna have a new quality. Uh, I'm gonna have a special, or it's a new style. Don't forget to have your price opener still there available, but maybe the balance needs to change. Change also the sourcing. Talk about optimization of fabrics, optimization of, of trims, where there you could produce more buttons, get a better price, but the consumer is not going to really notice sometimes if the button says A or says B. It's the same white button, same quality. So I think that we need to be more smart, smartification, optimization of processes, engineering of product. And then, yes, there's the price you will need to compensate there with other things, but the customer cannot get the full hit, but also the company cannot get the full hit. So you need to balance. And then in the shift, yes, the shift of, of how they're spending money, it's about, make, let's make sure that instead of, if they're gonna not buy four t-shirts and only buy three, let's make sure that you are one of the three, that you are not the one that they're throwing out of your closet. Marcel, I love the fact that you're looking internally and you're not just pushing the price on the customer. That's really outstanding. Yeah. And I mean, all retailers should really be doing that. So kudos to you and your team for looking at how you can do better on the you know, process and the costing side. The other element I'd love to just go back to for a minute is one of your pillars is people. Um, I think that uh, it would be great if you could just kind of summarize for us your uh, employment factors of a global brand. You have a lot of diverse group of employees across many different markets. Would love to hear your points on diversity, equity, inclusion, the employment uh, climate, it. and employer choice. Uh, first of all, favorite question. There, a few days ago, somebody asked me, which are the areas that you enjoy most of CEO? And I said, there's many, but one that I have a passion is people. They know it, it's because I believe they are the ones that are able to make you succeed. I am who I am because I always have been surrounded of incredible people that loves my vision, but comes with ideas, supports me. So 
how, what have we done with the organization? We have 60 nationalities in the organization to start. Um, we have brought a lot of people to know how to live in Spain. We need to change even our way of hiring people. How do we put the vacancies? Because if you are a global brand, it's not only about where you live, it's how you live somewhere else and do you understand the culture of the other country? Do you understand the weather of the other country to design for that works for everyone? So we have that. Um, if I think about gender equality, it's incredible. It, it's super mixed. I think that we are very lucky that in the fashion industry, um, you have a very big attraction for women, but we have been promoting a lot the, the growth of uh, men, of women, of but also having young talent, a young age at senior position. You know, it, that's where diversity comes. I always feel it's, it's about gender, it's about culture, background, but it's also about age. You know, um, you need old blood and you need new blood. You need 25 years kids, but you also need 60 years old uh, leaders because that gives new ideas in a very different way from a, from a more risky to a more, um, I would say, smart. And that balance is, is very good. We have done a lot to promote that. We have done a lot to promote um, because I think it's part of our responsibility as leaders. It's not because it's an obligation. It's a responsibility. So many people say, oh, we need. No, we don't need. You need to be convinced and you need to see the benefits of having such a diverse <coughs> and a business. It starts by how do you produce products? How do you produce marketing? How do you produce, uh, you know, your code of conduct? It, 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 it affects everyone now. To get to make this happen, we need to implement a lot of things. As I said, from the way we recruit people all the way to the environment we have in the office, how mm. we change from being a Spanish-speaking first language to an English-speaking company. All presentation is to be in English, all of them. Doesn't matter if everyone in the room are Spanish or Spanish speakers, you know? Because by nature, the country always will have a 60 to 70% representation of the country, but everything needs to be in English. All our internal communication needs to be in English. And it's very nice because then you speak, I always say, an international English. Because mm. having English brands, even a very big in, uh, office based in the UK, I cannot only think about the UK language. I need to think English that a German can understand, that a Mexican can understand, that a Hindu can understand. We have a big organization in, in India with 300, 400 employees. So there you can see already, how do you think about it? And in that culture, we also are investing a lot in people. And we always think about training and all. we invest on how do we work a hybrid remote work? You know, how do you balance between collaboration and physical work? Because the industry is about creativity. And how do you make sure that you have that flexibility of remote? So we found a very good balance where everybody comes to the office certain days of the week. So we create friendship, we create collaboration, invention. We, we come with ideas, but also you have that time of working from home that brings other quality and well balance to people. We have, um, we try to do a lot of activities from drinks to sports, the things that we would join people together who share things. And we have an incredible learning and development uh, platform with over 10,000 trainings that they can train anytime. No, it's investing in people for them to, they will be, give it back to you. They will give it back with less yeah. rotation, with the passion to, to believe in that transformation because <clears throat> agility requires a lot of energy. So you need to give them, you know, the fuel for them to feel that. Um, it's, a, it's, it's very interesting the, how everybody has just taken it already for granted. It's not even, hey, what about this? It just goes natural. Great point, Marcelo, great point. And there's another area which um, I know you, are um, you know pushing forward with, and you're really having some a, a good impact, and that's this whole issue of sustainability. And um, I know that the company, um, your company, is using 
responsible materials as, uh, you know, like the Better Cotton Initiative um, and recycled fibers while minimizing the use of water and haz hazardous uh, chemicals. And there is certainly a focus on renewable energy in offices, warehouses, and stores. And I know you also introduced sustainable packaging, um, which is very interesting. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you are doing to min minimize the quote unquote <laughs> carb carbon footprint and your focus on being a sustainable company? Very, very interesting, Robin. I think some suddenly sustainability became a couple of years ago, a big first marketing vehicle, then became a government regulation. Now the consumer was demanding like all the, yeah. so we have governments, financial institutions, consumers, everybody talking about sustainability. And I said, look, again, it's like diversity and inclusion. It's our responsibility. It cannot be that a government is pushing us to do better things for the planet. So for three years ago, when I started, I created four pillars. Products, people, partners, and places. Ah. So sustainability needs to be touching all these four. When we talk about product, all the things that you said about uh, all the raw materials, uh, sustainable materials, chemicals, no usage of minimize all the chemicals, no hard use of chemicals, animal welfare. For each brand, we have a platform. But one of the big things I asked the team was, don't show me great ideas, show me great impact. So instead of making one jacket that will sell 500 pieces, it has an incredible storyline. We are not gonna change the world with 500 jackets. We are gonna change the world with our denims, for example, in Pepe, that represents 35% of our turnover. You know, the amount of jeans that we sell. So why don't we look, all of us, all the company, how do we make our jeans more sustainable? So what we did is that is an impact. So we changed all jeans are now, all of them, 99% used with um, responsible materials. That means BCI, cotton, on, no hardest chemicals. We have all kind of, um, we save millions of water, but millions, because we have a partner with a great company uh, that there's a technology called Wiser Wash that we, it's washing the product wiser. So with one cup of glass in of 10 liters of water, we can wash the same jeans by air and ozone. And, mm. and then I said, you see what means all partnering together? Or for example, in Hackett, how do we make all our lambswool sweaters? You know, how do we make sure that we are taking all this lambswool from sustainable farms? <clears throat> um, so I think product was very important now. You can do great product, but if you are not being investing in people, that means fair salaries with, with our factories. How is the quality of how the people are working in, our, in the factories? What are we investing for the underdeveloped countries? What are we investing in our people's well-being? How are we avoiding the overstress? So people, it's also a part of our sustainable planet. Not only the factories, also in our offices. Then the third one was about the place, the partners, all our suppliers that we have, but not only of garments, but the one of our stationery, the one that's our partner in digital. We asked to have that mindset, okay? To have the mindset. They need to, we need to all team up. They help me, they, we help them. How do we team up to have that? And we do a lot of social programs. We have uh, every month at least a social program. Instead of wasting the product, how do we donate product? How do we help certain uh, certain diners? How do we help you know certain societies when uh, we have problems like Ukraine? How do we give jobs to people that needs jobs? And then the last one that's about our places where we are talking about all renewable energy in all our stores, in our offices. What do we do with all, uh, for example, we don't have garbage cans. People need to walk so that we can recycle things. Everybody doesn't have a private. Sometimes you need to walk 20, 30 meters to get one garbage can. But we like that. That also make, helps people to make exercise. We recycle everything, but then put, uh, the CO2 footprint, it's very important for us 
logistically wise. So we are creating a, how do we create a rounds to the UK in our vans? What type of cars are we using? Who are our logistic partners? How are we using? How do we avoid air freight in product? We go back to the flow optimization, you know, better to have it by sustainable vessels, sustainable trucks. And I think, and packaging is a big one because we love e-commerce, but the amount of packaging that goes in there, it's ridiculous. So also we are promoting to, sure. avoid, to reduce the footprint, <clears throat> the carbon footprint by bringing it to store, combining orders and all this kind. And part of the shipping cost goes to donations of, uh, of uh, minimizing the CO2 footprint. Well, I'm sure you're making a big difference. Um, I hope. And, I, look, I hope. Yeah. So, um, you know, your initiatives are incredible and absolutely necessary. Um, anyway, I know we're, we're kind of running out of time, Marcella, but uh, before we um, wrap up, um, tell us what's on the horizon for AWWG in uh, this year and beyond. I, what's in the horizon? I think the horizon is to continue evolving. I think that is something that uh, we need to stay, uh, keep moving. Otherwise, we are going to become unrelevant. So what's in the horizon? I would say that at the end, it's about evolution. It's evolving and making sure that our history is based, it's built, our future is built in our past. That's it. So in the horizon for me, it's the continuous evolution and making sure that the, the business continues speaking to the consumer. We cannot be a one way. We need to speak to the consumer. We need to be an emotional uh, business. We need to be there for the consumers. As a business is to continue growing. We are looking for expansion in new, new territories. We want to, one of the big uh, focus points for the next three years is definitely the US market. Want to Great. go there? Yes, that's one of the big ones. We already started by expanding a lot in uh, Latin America, so we see horizon the U.S. It's a big horizon for us. We are we want to continue with the incredible uh, awareness we have in India and all the countries around that that is working very good. And Europe, I think Europe, we need to make sure that um, we don't stop being relevant. Thank you, Marcel. It's great having you on our show. I know we're over time, Robin. You want to do the wrap up for us? Yeah, you know, I, yeah. I first of all, it was great having you, Marcel, and I'm very impressed with uh, your knowledge and the way you've, uh, you know, built your culture and your your pillars and so forth. It's very impressive. And you know, as as I watch the big picture of transformation around the globe, um, there's an astounding amount of commonality and similarity of the huge challenges, but also of the opportunities, which, you know, which makes your sharing with us today. And of course, at the World Retail Congress, uh, it's hugely important for that reason. So sharing with leaders around the world and speaking, speaking of which <clears throat> we wish you great success in your big speaking session there. And I would, by the way, urge our listeners to attend. Barcelona isn't so shabby in April, right? So in closing, Marcella, um, please tell our listeners uh, uh, that are attending the WRC uh, what day and time you are speaking. So first of all, just to wrap up, as now my side, Robin, Shelley, don't mm -hmm. stop doing this. We as leaders, we need this podcast. It's incredible to hear what's happening with other industries with other companies with other leaders because we are all confronting that and this is one of the magic things of having digitalization around us so i encourage you to continue inviting all of us to attend uh, this podcast and we are going to be supporting on my side i want to ask everyone to really go and attend the world retail congress it's going to be great in barcelona I'm gonna be there on the 25th of April, uh, around mid, uh, midday, around 13, 13 hours, so around one, two o'clock of the afternoon. Uh, I believe it's 1.45. Uh, 
but it's very important. It's not only to look at me. That's why I don't know. I want to tell everyone, go and attend from 10 o'clock to 8 o'clock because I think all the round tables, mm. all the panels are very, very interesting. I'm going to be attending most of them because I also want to learn from my colleagues, from other leaders in the industry. I don't say that one is better than the other. I think it's just great that we can all get there and learn from each other. Great. So thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you for being here. For our listeners, you can find more of our podcast on Apple, Spotify, Buzzsprout, and of course, therodmanreport.com. Look for us on YouTube where we broadcast our podcast um, and link in with us for the latest thoughts about the industry. And, Mar and Marcella, yeah, we learned a lot today and thank you again. It was terrific. And I want to thank all of our listeners. Um, and once again, every week I invite any of you to send me an email with a topic that you would like Shelly and I to cover. Um, my email is <clears throat> robin at therobinreport.com. Thank you all again.